community that we test every single night, not just testing night. What's up? Welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 278. My name is Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host on the show. I'm the founder of Whistlekick Sparring Gear and Apparel, and today I am joined by my friend, Mr. Sean Twing. If you're new to the show, you can check out everything we're doing at WhistlekickMartialArtsRadio.com. And over at Whistlekick.com, you can check out the products that we make, the other websites that we have, and all the great things that we're doing for you, the traditional martial artist. If you've made a purchase recently, thank you. Welcome to the family. I appreciate your support for all the things that we are doing. If you'd like to make a purchase, I would love to see you do so. We're making some good stuff. We're always planning more good stuff. And hopefully, someday, we can count you as one of our customers. Some martial arts practitioners train for titles. They're looking to gain respect from others. But Mr. Sean Twing is not one of those martial artists. He trained martial arts with a mindset of humility. And though he's earned the title of master, it doesn't define him. The tradition that his father passed on is one he plans to continue, though that wasn't always the case. Mr. Twing pulls no punches when it comes to sensitive topics like respect, ego, and title. Let's welcome him to the show. Hey, Master Twing, I got you. Mr. Mr. I thought... I thought I thought you went by a master now with the promotion. No, we talked about that last time. Fourth oh. on. So it's weird. Our tradition is fifth on is master, okay. whereas the Kukiwan tradition is fourth on is master, which I didn't even, it's funny, I didn't even know that until we were at the instructor's course in November. Yeah. And everybody kept addressing me as master. I was like, dude, I got, you can see the four stripes on my belt. What's up? And that just happened, dude. Is part of the one of the conversations <laughs> realized that we just right, right. don't do it that way, whatever. Right. So it's and kind it, of, I've actually been wondering about that since then. It's kind of funny. And of course, in you know, in my Taekwondo tradition, it is fourth. Which... Well, it makes sense. I see. This is what I, I. This is the only thing I can think of that might explain it. Um, my father was a fourth don before he reconnected with his instructor, and he he used he referred to himself as Mister. And he didn't change. Uh, he wasn't ref- uh, didn't go by the term master until after his instructor promoted him. Um, so I'm thinking maybe we just kept with that tradition. Like you know, the head instructor was a fourth don and was Mister and wasn't master mm. until late. I don't know. That's the only explanation I can think of. Or we're just contrarian by nature, one or the other. <laughs> well, I think ma- martial arts is contrarian by nature. That's right. Isn't that the truth? <laughs> you know, it's it's interesting to me to watch all the the different stuff around rank title ego etc and and there's a there's a facebook group that i'm i guess i can't say i'm part of it because i started it and it's a private group but it's it's a bunch of friends people that you know you're mutual friends with as well i think i may have even invited you to it and one of the questions that went up recently was kind of general around titles and what do you think of titles? And there's just been some fascinating stuff because, of, because of course I can refer to you, you know, accidentally inadvertently as master twing and there's respect in that, but I could also call you Mr. Twing and it means something completely different. Right. You know, the word and the intent behind them aren't always connected. And it's interesting, too. We had this conversation recently about there were a group of black belts uh, who were together. It was actually we were at the same instructor's course. It was just four days, and it was intense, you know, 13-hour days. And we had sort of this late-night conversation about um, what, which, what I see as kind of this interesting progression. Like, they're in this group, there are black belts who I knew as lower ranks, so I had called them by their first name. And then now I call them as Mr. or Miss. And there was another person there who was a black belt who I've always referred to as Mr. And I'm not comfortable calling him by his first name, even though he's, he's a good friend. And then there was an, another person there who was a black belt who I've known for a very long time, who is a good friend, who if I'm being, it's not more formal, but it's a, it, I may call her by her first name. And that is in that situation, actually more respectful because that's sort of acknowledging the nature of our relationship that 
you know, I, don't, I, I make, I would always refer to her as miss uh, in a class context or if we were in anything where anybody were, were listening, but there was also this profound respect in also referring to her by her first name, like saying that, that there's kind of this interesting recognition that uh, we're close enough that we can, we can go this even, we can kind of come full circle mm. um, and have and show each other profound respect on a first name basis, because the respect is now no longer associated with title. It's, it's relationship, which I just thought was really interesting. Like I had never noticed that before. Yeah. It, re respect is so subjective in one sense, in the way that it manifests, I think between people, but I think the, the heart of respect is always the same. Right. If I respect yeah, a, you, if you respect me, we may show it differently, but you can see it. You know what respect looks like regardless of the actions that are taken. Absolutely. And there's, you know, there's a funny thing. It's like I was in the military, but I assume it's kind of like the military where, you know, you're, you're bowing to the rank or you're saluting the rank. Um, which I get it. I had, you know, black belt is black belt is black belt. I'm gonna, you know, if I see a black belt in any context, I'm happy to bow to them. If I don't know them, it doesn't matter. Um, I appreciate that they've done something significant and I'm showing respect for that. Um, so I'm bowing to the rank in most situations, but I don't respect the rank. I respect the person. Um, so it's kind of like, okay, I will acknowledge your rank and I will show, you know, I will sort of defer to your rank, not knowing you sight unseen. Uh, but respect itself that's that's earned and you know once you start engaging with someone you're like oh this person's a pompous ass all right i mean you know yes i'll continue to bow to your rank but my level of respect may be a little different versus oh we get to know each other and like wow this person is you know i really think this person represents that well mm -hmm. uh, and there's a lot that i just i feel that sense of respect it's just it's a subtle difference but i mean you've experienced it we've all experienced it yeah yeah and, and and I think I have the hardest time when someone comes up to me, someone that doesn't know me and they just, they almost want to put me up on this pedestal, right? you know, because of, because of the belt, because, you know, the edges are a little frayed or because, you know, they, they've heard that I've trained other places or about this show or just what, for whatever reason, they, they want to just give me this, this deference and I've never felt I've earned that right. I, I, or not earned deserve. I don't deserve that because I'm a, I'm a human being. And right. I, think, I think, I think you and I, you and I have had a number of conversations and I think we're pretty similar in this regard that for me, that for me, accepting titles is almost more to not make waves with some of the people that are around me. Sure makes it a lot easier. Everybody's on the same page because you, if you, if you approach it differently than, you know, the other 50 people around you, then it kind of throws the whole thing out of kilter. So you just, I had a, I heard um, an instructor talk about this, which I thought was such an interesting thing that his wife was, he was a Taekwondo instructor, is a Taekwondo instructor. Uh, he would, his wife was training in Kung Fu nearby and after class he would go over to wait for her and if there was like a half an hour left of class and every time he walked in um, to the, the training area the sifu for that that um, kung fu class would stop the class and bow to him and acknowledge that a black belt had entered the training area and after you know at one point after he pulled the sifu aside and said you know sir you, you don't have to do that i'm just here I, I you know i'm kind of embarrassed i'm just here to you know wait for my wife or whatever i like to watch class and the sifu was like pretty much it's it's not your choice man <laughs> you know it's like you're a black belt that's the deal suck it up when you walk in class stops we're gonna bow to you period and it was kind of like it's just such a funny thing to because as human, you know, some of us just, we don't, it feels odd. You know, some people would demand that. Uh, but some of us, it's kind of like, that just seems so strange. I just love that story. Like, hey, you know, you've, you've earned it and now you got to suck it up and deal with it. <laughs> and to me, I see kind of both sides of that. It's interesting because on the one hand, yeah, that to offer that respect. But then if you truly respect that person and they're asking you, hey, I'm not really comfortable with this. Is it... It could almost be disrespectful to not honor their wishes in that right. case. Yeah, then you get this interesting circle where we're like, all right, exactly. Well, what? Yeah, I, I look at that as like, you know, if I'm in, if I'm coming to hang out at your house, then it's 
your rules, you know, it's a little different than the, you know, the, the home totally. poker game, you know, it's your, your house, your rules. So uh, if your rules say that a black belt enters the facility and everybody stops and bows and I'm hanging out at your house, well, guess what? Everybody's going to stop and bow. You know, if you want to come play in my sandbox and uh, I, you know, and I may make that decision knowing that that's your tradition so that when you enter, I may stop and acknowledge that, but not feel like, another instructor would have to do the same thing for me. I think that's an easy solution, but I love it. I mean, I love this stuff because it's, it's exactly this kind of uh, spiral of interest. Like what is, what does all this stuff actually mean at the end of the day? Yeah. And it really just becomes this kind of microcosm for exploring humanity and psychology and, and how all of that comes together. When we talk about respect, it's, you can earn respect but the more I think about it, you can't demand it. It can only be given. Yeah, exactly. And I just, I, I keep looking at that more and more, this, this notion of respect and how it flows. If respect is a sentiment, you know, it's, it's an, um, kind of an emotion. It's kind of an energy. And it has to move. It has to transition in order for it to fill its purpose, which means I have to give it over. If I respect you, I give you respect. I mean, that's the verb that we use. Right. Yeah, absolutely. You, nobody's ever said, I take respect from you. That's right. I've I, never I, heard that. I, I mean, have, I have now taken respect from you. It, <laughs> Deal with it. <laughs> if I've, if I read that, I assume it's a terrible translation. Right. Right. That's interesting. Yeah. I get, it's funny because we're both on the same page. I get wound up about this stuff too. Like we have, uh, and this is sort of one of my weird things that I'm known for, uh, at least in, in those younger I train where we have red belts who are, you know, once you get your red belt, your your best case scenario about a year away from being able to test for black belt. So, long period of time. You know, we give red belts a hard time to make that transition to sort of get them ready. Um, and then there's sort of one school of thought where you start hearing people uh, start referring to red belts by sir or ma'am, um, occasionally or a mister or a miss. And I and I'm just I'm fanatical about it. I'm like you don't get the title. You don't get that recognition until you get the belt. Not because I don't respect the person. It's like, okay, now you're a black belt. Now I respect you. It's because I don't want to dilute it. Like I want there to be a transition where it's like, I will call you by your first name right up until the moment you wear the belt. And then I will never call you by your first name again, because I want there to be some distinction. And I'm not doing it to be a jerk. I'm not doing it because I don't respect the person at all. And it's, and sometimes it's difficult because it, oftentimes like we have a candidate for black belt, uh, next, next Friday. And, you know, this is someone I've, I've put a lot of heart and soul and time and energy into. It's someone who I, I like a lot and really am, am involve myself in his training. I'm incredibly proud of him. And I have a tremendous amount of respect for him. But he's a red belt. <laughs> it's like, I'm, I'm going to call you by your first name. I'm going to give you a hard time. When another instructor recalls you Mr. or says, sir, after class, I'm going to make you do push-ups for that. Like, I'm going to do all that stuff. And then next Friday, he'll get the rank and it'll never happen again. Like, I'll never. It, it's just, it's weird. It's such a funny thing. But it, it, to me, it's very important to recognize that distinction. As you were talking about this person. You you said that what the words you used. I've put a lot of time into this person. That's kind of a, a funny sentence construct, isn't it? Outside of martial arts, I don't think we talk about that too often. To put time into a person, you might put time into a relationship. You might put time right. into a business or a, a hobby. But I think anybody that's been a martial arts instructor probably knows exactly what that feels like to put time into a person. So what is, you know, for the people listening that aren't instructors or maybe wouldn't use the words in that way, what does that mean? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I've, I'm now in my second college class that I'm teaching. And it, it, I think teaching does have some of that. You do put effort into people when you teach. So I don't know that it's, it's just the martial arts. I think the martial arts, it's a different kind, kind of time investment. Um, but I, I, it does feel like that. Like I'm not, I'm not expending effort or energy or any kind of thought into building up my relationship with this person. That's a byproduct. Um, and the relationship was really independent of it. I mean, he's out there on the mats. I'm out there on the mats. We're you know, night after night after night. We're going to have a relationship. Um, and it's not like it wasn't never a thought like, oh, well, I really want to get to know this person. Uh, so let me give him some feedback or let me get involved. It was more, um, 
I saw this person training hard and I saw some things he could do better. And I, I brought that to his attention and I, and I offered him a choice. I said, you know, you're at a fork in the road. You have a movement pattern for a fundamental kick that is not serving you well. You're just not doing it right. And you're at a rank where you've done it now, I don't know, 10, 12,000 times wrong. Or, you know, if you don't want to call it wrong, really not right. I said, so you can go, you can get a black belt with that. And you'll, you'll have this for the rest of your life. And you'll struggle with it. And you'll wish that you fixed it. I said, or you can... F- we can work on fixing it now. And, and I told him, I said, I don't need, I don't need an answer right now. Tell me next class. Um, I said, but the deal is if you want to fix it, you don't ever get to throw that crappy round kick again. At least mm-hmm. not with me seeing it. You're going to have to throw really uncomfortable. You're going, and I told him, so you have to be uncomfortable for a long time to rebuild, you know, Tiger Woods rebuilding his swing kind of thing. So that's what, that's what we're going to do. Um, so there was in that, in that moment. And then when I came back to the next class, he said, I, I, I want to do this right. So whatever it takes to do it right, I want to do it. Well, now he had my attention. I'm like, okay, so now I've, I've made a step toward this person and that person has now made a step toward me. Now it's on me to bring out the best in him. Now, if he'd said, no, no, thanks. Whatever. It doesn't mean I just like, okay, see you later. I'm never going to help. It just means I couldn't help there. But that told me a lot about him as a person, told me a lot about him as a martial artist. Um, and I, for whatever reason, I saw that. I'm like, OK, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to invest whatever it takes because he's willing to invest whatever it takes. I mean, he struggled. You know, the first three months were miserable. Um, but then, you know, then you started to see like, wait a minute, that looked like a pretty good round kick. Uh, and then all of a sudden there were more good round kicks than not good round kicks. And now he just has a rock solid round kick and he's going to test for black belt and he's bringing with him a black belt level round kick. And I'm like, right, that's what it's supposed to look like. That's what it's supposed to be. That's what it's supposed to feel like. Um, So it does very much feel like an investment in a person, but it's an investment that I don't, I expect no, no dividends from it. I expect no payoff for it. I don't need him to, you know, walk off the floor after testing and come over and say, you know, I couldn't have done it without it. Like that would make me horribly uncomfortable. I didn't do the pushups for him. I didn't do the, the reps. He did them. Um, so that investment in another person is, um, I think it's without expectation of anything else. It's for the pure love of the, the art or the love of, uh, of excellence. What I don't know what it is, but that's it. That's the deal. Not, um, not for some need to then you know make a champion who later comes back and says, "Oh, you know, I never would have done it without you." That would that would make me horribly uncomfortable. Mm. You described offering this suggestion to this student as taking a step towards them, and then they took a step towards you, and that was the point where you said, "Okay, now, now it's time to work on this. Now it's time to teach them to to help them." That could almost sound contradictory to the notion of investing in someone. I've seen instructors, and and honestly, I've been guilty of it myself in the past, of wanting someone to succeed more than they wanted to. (laughs) Right. I was was the recipient of that when I was younger. I had a lot of people around me who really uh, were trying to get me to do something that I was unwilling to do, and and I'm willing to put the time in. And I can only imagine how frustrating that must have been. I mean, I can, I can project myself back and, and imagine being in their shoes and just think, wow, they really, they, they really did a lot of work that was not, was not paying dividends at the time, at least. But now I look back on that 30 something years later and realize it, it kind of did pay dividends because it, I still look back on that and remember like, okay, there were people out there who were dedicated to helping me succeed despite me not trying to at all. Um, so, you know, I have a model of how I can behave too. Mm. How do you keep yourself from, I'll ask it differently. How do you make sure you're putting in the right amount of effort with a student? How do you keep from underselling them, you know, or, or shortchanging them? That's the word. Or attempting to force that investment down their throat. <laughs> Where's the question. line? Yeah, I mean, for so, I, I think about this a lot, and I think ultimately we can we can put the canvas out there, but the student has to paint. You know, so, in the canvas may be a drill, a canvas may be a class, 
uh, who knows what the canvas actually is, could be an entire program. Uh, but the student has to get out there and say, I want to create something with this. And, you know, I see this all the time where we'll have a class that a third of the students in the class are listening to every nuance that an instructor says. They're doing every nuance. They're forcing themselves into positions that are not entirely comfortable or um, because they want to push those edges. And then there's, you know, a third in the middle that's, um, you know, they're, they're, they're doing some things differently. They're, they're pushing a little bit, but they're not really uncomfortable. They're just kind of exploring the edges. Um, and then there's a third or so that you don't even real. You're not even sure that they heard anything that you said because they're doing the exact same thing they've done since day one with that technique, exploring none of the nuance that you just suggested. Um, and you know, my personality, I I at least call people's attention to that. I don't want to single somebody out and say, "Hey, I noticed." You know, we've been doing fast kick for the last half an hour, and I've gone through fifty variations, and you've done the exact same thing through all fifty. And I don't want to call an individual out and say that. Uh, but I do bring it to everybody's attention that there is a spectrum that I'm observing. And one end of that spectrum is really pushing the edges. The other spectrum is staying in the comfort of habit. And here are the consequences of those two things. You know, if you want to push on the edges, it's going to be uncomfortable now, but you will progress faster. If you want to stay where it's really comfortable now, that, that rut or that groove becomes a rut very soon and you'll wake up and 10 years will go by and you will have the you will be doing the exact same thing that you are doing right now so those are the choices you know that that's the canvas you choose how you want to paint uh, but i'm not someone who is going to go and grab the student by the shoulders and say you're doing this wrong and yeah, do it right and, and wrong is subjective mm. of course too you talked about people investing in you and maybe over investing in you at the time, but it, it ended up working out. When did you start? You, you talked about your father. You, you've talked about a few things. I'm thinking we should go back a little bit. Yeah, it's funny because we did this once and now I now it's trying to remember what we actually talked about. <laughs> so I started training when I was 12 and 46. Now um, I tested for my first degree black belt in Korea at the Kukiwan in 1997 um, tested for and received my, my first degree black belt. Um, Prior to, so I, I, you know, it's four years between um, white belt and black belt prior to, you know, during that time, you know, I, I definitely, you know, went through the motions. It was very old school training. My father was an incredible instructor. Uh, I picked up a lot, but I didn't have that. Um, well, my memory of it is that I didn't really have that inner fire that some people have, some people don't. So prior to, um, prior to going to Korea, test probably a solid six months before that one of the black belts where i was training uh, put together this whole chart and it was like a countdown calendar and it, it played off a story my father told about when he was stationed in korea um you know the sort of the countdown chart the figmo chart you know forget it i've got my orders you know you count down to when you're you're leaving um and he sort of made that for me and was like, we're going to, we're going to make this happen. And was like way into it. And I was just, I just, it just bounced off me. It was like, yeah, great. That, that sounds great. I'm going to train. And I didn't, it didn't really change my training. Um, and it just didn't, it didn't push me or I didn't, you know, I didn't move toward whatever it was. Now, it's a long time to look back on it's 30 years ago, but I look back on it and think, I just didn't, I didn't respond to that, you know, we got to Korea, um, you know, incredible opportunity, you know, and, and I, you know, it was hard. I, I tested, we got the front, I think we fought the Korean national high school team or something. So we had to do some really interesting stuff and it was fun, but I did not love the training. I did not love the experience and I certainly didn't love the testing. And I, and now I do, I love my practice and I love my training and I, I love everything about it. So when I look back on that, I realized there were people who in retrospect were going out of their way to bring out something better in me. And I didn't respond to it. I didn't respond to it then. Um, I like to think it just took me a long time to respond to it. Why? You know, we, we haven't talked a, a ton about your father, but you know, I have some outside knowledge of, of you and, and your father, it almost, I think a lot of people, if they had known, if they, they knew your father's legacy, they would look at the contrast between him and your self-described lack of fire 
and find that fascinating. Do you have yeah, any insight? Yeah, I mean, I think this happens. But this is a pretty stereotypical thing. You know, the football coach with the, you know, son or dog, I guess it would be a son who just not really interested in football, but is on the team and never really excels. I mean, it's kind of that, that was kind of that thing happening. Um, you know, I trained from, you know, I was one of the original 12 students in Randolph. I trained year, you know, night after night after night. I think one of the things that was challenging for me is it was not a choice, um, which is a challenge, but it's also pretty great in retrospect. Um, but, you know, we went over to Randolph Tuesdays, Thursdays, every single week, two hours of class each night. Um, I think in the, I don't know, in the time, the four years between white belt and black belt, I don't know that I missed two classes total. There was never a choice. And I think, you know, when you're 12 to 16, at some point you kind of think, wow, this Taekwondo thing is really getting to be a lot and not having any choice you know, makes you, I, I'm sure at some level felt like I didn't have you know, a lot of agency in the situation. I don't know. It could have been laziness. I mean, it could have been a million things. You know, I would love to blame. I know it's not, I say that I don't, I actually don't want to blame at all, but I could, I could spend a lot of time and blame a lot of factors. You know, one of my best friend who you've also interviewed on the, the podcast was an incredible um, athlete. He showed up, he was amazing. I, you know, I'm standing next to someone who's incredible. And it's like, all right, that's it. I'm done. Is that true? No, that's not, that's not what happened. All that was independent of what was actually happening. So I think I just didn't, I don't know. I just didn't really have that drive to fall in love with it. And I didn't find that drive until much later in life, coming back to take when I was an adult thinking you know, after thinking I would never train again. So it's interesting to look back on it. I don't feel like it was wasted time. You know, there was, I certainly, from a technical perspective, I laid the tracks for technique and laid the tracks for how to train and for the power development and lots of things, had great relationships. Um, but I just didn't, I didn't fully take advantage of that situation. And I wish I had, maybe, unless it would have affected my training now. <laughs> like, I don't want to, I don't want to have gone back and, and mess up what I have for, for a training discipline now. So, yeah. Yeah, we are where we are because of where we've been. Exactly. Like, I think I had to go through the desert or have a reference for the desert to appreciate the oasis. And I think, I don't know that I would appreciate what I have right now as much. Um, and I, and I, my daughter also trains now. She started when she was 12. I'm, my The differential between my age and her age is the same as my father's age and my age. So um, all of that kind of synced up. And I think I have a little bit better understanding of how to manage that relationship because of how I was on the other side of it. Uh, you know, my father was, um, my father was take, in the, the gym environment. My father was the, you know, the head instructor. He was the, he was instructor first, father second, um, not in any weird, you know, mean way or bad way or whatever, but in that environment, he was the head instructor. His job was to be the head instructor. And I was one of the students and I appreciate that. Um, and with my daughter, I played the role of black belt first, dad second for a long time, a couple of years. And after a couple of years, I realized I'm actually, my job is dad first, black belt second. So when I interact with my daughter, my job is to have that. And even if it's in class, even if we're in uniform, my job is to come to her first as her father. And you know, if she says, Hey, I don't, yeah, I'm not feeling great. And I don't, I don't want to, you know, I want to step off the mat. instead of having the demeanor of, you know, the black belt, who's sort of asking her questions from that perspective, um, especially the dad black belt, uh, to, to come to her as her dad say, okay, what's going on? What's up? Your knee hurts. Okay. Is it hurt because of this? Uh, are you distracted? What, you know, it's like, what's going on? What's, do you want to go five more minutes or do you, do you really feel like you need to do it? But to, to meet her there like dad and be caring like dad um, and to be her cheerleader. You know, that was one thing my father wasn't. And I didn't think it would have been weird if he were, um, but my father wasn't my cheerleader in anything martial art related. And for a million reasons, 99% of which I probably can't remember accurately. Um, so I look at that and with my daughter, I want to be her cheerleader and not cheerleader, like on the side of the mask, like hey, everything you're doing is the greatest thing in the world, but to always lead with her with that positivity of, you know, 
I'm speaking to you as your dad and I just saw, you know, you just had a testing and it looked like it was really hard, but you powered through. So let's focus on all of the good and what happened. And sure, later we can talk about the technical things you can change and how you can improve. And that's great. We'll talk about all that. I'll come to you as, as the instructor role, not her instructor, but a black belt instructor role later. But for now, I want to be dad and I want to pat you on the back and give you a hug and tell you that was awesome. And now, and then we can move on from there. Like that's a, that's a big lesson that I've learned. Do you think things would have been different for you if he had been a cheerleader in addition to your instructor? Uh, you know, I don't know. It's a good question. Um, I don't, you know, one of my rules of life now is I don't want to need external positive reinforcement or any reinforcement, you know, external whatsoever. I want all of that to come from within. So if, if I look at it through that lens, you know, I start to cringe <laughs> like, Oh, you know, if he'd come up and said, wow, that looked great. I'm like, Oh, I throw up in my mouth a little bit. So, uh, there's a, a weird discomfort and in some of my better memories of him, uh, were when he was not in a cheerleader role, one of my favorite memories of him was driving back from a, uh, I tested for red belt, which I failed. Um, I believe I failed my red belt testing or red the two red belt testings twice. Um, but this was the, my first failure as a red belt or testing for red belt. Uh, but we had traveled it was about an hour and a half um, tested. I thought my testing went very well. At the time, we had um, a requirement for that testing where you had to break uh, three boards with a sidekick with each leg. And I was, I think, 15 at the time. I was a tall kid, probably weighed 160 pounds or so. So three boards was pretty legit. Uh, and you had three attempts on each side to do it. So I made my break. Um, I think one of the times I felt I didn't make my break. But this one, I made my break. I, everything seemed like it was great. Um, Everybody was called up for their rank, and I wasn't called up. And you can imagine the car ride home. You know, dad's driving in the front seat, mom sitting in the front seat, um, not saying a whole lot. I'm sitting in the back seat, not happy at all. Um, I'm in. I did have people come up to me say, you know, it was a good test. You know, they look good. It was a good test, and that's all anybody said. Uh, but I very distinctly remember. Somewhere on 89 South, <laughs> my father reaching up, adjusting the mirror so he could see me. Uh, and he said, you were not going to pass this testing no matter what you did, because I didn't like what I've been seeing in the gym for the last three months. Adjust the mirror. That was it. So for the rest of the, you know, the drive home, I started thinking about what's the last three months look like in the gym. Uh, I've been kind of slacking here or there, you know, maybe, you know, and I had to do the, the mental inventory. I wasn't psyched about it. You know, I didn't feel like, oh, that was a great decision, Dad. Thanks. Um, but it did remind me that we test every single night, not just testing night. And that's I, I wouldn't trade that lesson. If I could go back and have passed that testing, I would never do it because that was a profound lesson um, that things you can do or not do can and should affect whether or not you progress in rank at the time. And you can have a blowout performance. We've all seen people like that. They, they, they screw around in the gym. They don't put the effort in. They're naturally talented, athletic. They go out on the floor. Their testing looks incredible. They get the rank, they get the rank, they get the rank, but they don't have the character and they don't have, they're not, and it does a disservice to them too. So I, that's the kind of stuff that, you know, if I, if I could trade that, I would never, never trade that. Did you take anything from that in the way that you look at testing candidates? Because I'm, I'm guessing that there are some folks listening, because I, I think I'm putting myself in this group, who would look at that scenario and say, well, why test him? I think we, if we narrowly define testing as the time between when you're called up before the review board and the time that you sit down, then it does seem like a pretty weird thing. But if we define testing as the moment you get your new rank until the opportunity presents itself to get your next rank, then it makes perfect sense that I wouldn't, there was, there wasn't a mechanism in place to say, I mean, he, I guess he could have said, you know what, you're eligible to test, but I, I just, I don't like what I've been seeing. So I'm not going to put you out on the floor. Uh, that would have had some impact and I probably would have grumbled and all right, you know, whatever. And I don't know that I would have been that excited about that, How, but the way he did it 
that I did get to go out there and put myself in the fire. I did get to have that feeling of success of making the breaks, um, to have that, that belief like, wow, I went out there and I physically performed and to walk off the mats and have the focus on the physical and then realize later, Hey, guess what? The physical is just part of it. It's, you know, you pass that part of it, but the three months prior or six months prior, whatever it was, all the other stuff, you didn't do that. So now let's shine some attention on it, which it's such an interesting thing now because every time I step on the mats, every class does not matter. Every technique, every second I'm out there, I'm thinking that I'm testing and I'm not due to test again for like three and a half years. Um, and it's, but every moment I'm on the mats, I'm like, I'm, this is testing. This is preparation. You know, this is, am I in ready stance? Am I, did my eyes wander a little bit? You know, it's not like, Oh, who's looking, who cares? It's like, no, this is, I'm testing. I need to show up 100% every time. That's an ideal. Of course we don't. Um, but that's still the standard. That's still the ideal to show up that way every single moment. Um, so that's, I mean, I, that, I wouldn't trade that lesson for the world. What's going through your mind as you're doing that? I mean, that, that's a lot of intensity to hold on to. It's something that I think for some of us, most of us, arguably, we can do that for a <laughs> finite period of time. If you say you have to maintain this 100% level for an hour or two hours or you know a week of classes or even these 90 days, but the moment you say it's indefinite, that becomes a struggle for a lot of people mentally, emotionally. Absolutely. What, how, do you, how do you approach it? So I used to, I used to hide from who I am. It sounds like this weird, like deep psychological thing. That's not what I'm talking about. Like uh, I used to, you know, I can be super intense about things. And, you know, I, I, one of the things I say a lot, um, you know, as I teach in, in other situations is how you do anything is how you do everything. So the example I use a lot is if we're doing, if we're running around the dojo and we're going around the outside edges, um, you will see people who cut the corners. You know, just some people just shave off the corners and they go. Uh, if we're starting um, you know, back and forth drills, there is a coloration change in the mats that through the starting point. And you'll see people who have a, a foot halfway into the next mat to shave off you know, a little bit of effort. Um, if you do that, if that's how you approach things, then it shows up every, in my in opinion, in my experience, it shows up everywhere. That if you cut corners in how you, you know, present your uniform, how you fold your uniform, how you run a drill, your attention to detail, wherever you cut those corners, you know, it's that death by a thousand, you know, a thousand cuts that over time, and you know, and the math is kind of crazy. Like, you know, one of the examples I use, if we have a, um, like a kicking drill up the line from the back of the gym forward, uh, that extra half step seems inconsequential. Maybe every other time you get one extra rep, but you do that five times a night and you do that three nights a week. And then you multiply that by 30 years and you realize you've probably lost tens of thousands of reps from that one little decision or tens of I don't know, hundreds of miles of jogging before class by cutting that corner consistently. So the way when I look at that and within that model, um, for my my personality, the, the way I approach things, I don't do stuff halfway. I mean, if either I don't do something at all, um, which is you know selective attention. Um, but if I if something has my attention, then I've I've accepted this idea that I'm going to do me. Um, I don't ask you to do you know I don't ask you to do me. I, you, you do you. You know, and if if your approach is like, listen, I'm not going to train. For, and when I say you, I mean the imperial you. Uh, that if, if I'm talking to someone, they're like, oh, you know, I kind of, you know, my training is I like to, I like the two or three years in between testing to just kind of kick back and chill and sort of just have a really enjoy my, my time on the mats. And then I want to hit it hard for six months leading up to testing. And, and that's you and that's your thing. And then that, that works for you. That's it. I, that's perfect. I don't, I don't need to impose me on you. But where, what I used to do is I used to kind of tell myself like, Oh, that doesn't make any sense to me at all. I would I would never do that. But I would be apologetic. Like if someone said, like, why, you know, 
why are you so intense on the mats? Or why, you know, why, why are you putting so much power into that drill? You know, what, what is he, why are you doing that? And I would almost feel bad. And it was a fairly recent change. I'd say the last year, 18 months or so, where I was like, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not going to in, sort of interrupt your thing, but I'm also going to draw boundaries around mine and say, you know, if, if you want to get water during a water break and I want to do push-ups during a water break, I'm not commenting on you getting water. That's not what this is. This is not me editorializing. I'm not looking around saying, why isn't anybody else doing push-ups? Why, you know, why is everybody else getting water? I don't have any judgment about that at all. But at the time, I'm not thirsty and I have an opportunity for 30 or 40 push-ups and I'm going to take it. And I'm not going to apologize for it. Um, and I think that's, I, I think you just have to find your own your own groove. You know, I was at a seminar last weekend and, you know, I asked a lot of questions. I mean, detailed questions. And I could tell like, wow, I'm asking a lot of questions. But it's like, you know what? This is me. I want to figure this stuff out. I'm showing respect to this person because I really care about what they're teaching and I'm really immersed in it. And I'm going to ask the questions to really understand it. And I'm going to be okay with that. And if somebody else wants to just passively watch and think, wow, that guy, is, he sure is asking a lot of the questions. Uh, okay. That's cool. You do you. I'll do me. And everything's A-OK. -okay. That's kind of my my overall life philosophy. That's a long answer to a short question. What a great answer. No, I like it. it. I think the heart of what you just said was that you're not editorializing. And so often, whether it's in martial arts or the world in general, when someone does something differently than we do it, we look at it and think, well, if they're doing it that way, they must believe that what they're doing is right and thus what I'm doing is wrong. And that creates a defensiveness. Right. And of yeah, course, that's, that's, that's exactly the problem. That you, and, and that happens a lot. And that's, that's where what I said can go horribly wrong. So you do have to communicate. Um, and I, I think I'm better at that, but I, that is, that's the first step I should have mentioned, which you just touched on is that you know, this has to be external and clear to everybody else that I'm doing my thing because of, for me. And I'm, I'm in a, you know, we talk about all the time that you're, you're a mat, your imaginary opponent on the mats and, and it's, you know, the same person's your same size, your same everything. And, and I think that's a beautiful metaphor because that's who I'm competing with. Um, I'm out there competing with me from yesterday and I want me tomorrow to be better than me yesterday. And I'm not competing with you. I'm not judging you. I'm not anything you um, I might, if, if I switch gears and my, my role is to help you, I will help you with the same intensity that I help myself. And I have to be a little cautious about that, but, uh, but I'm not judging you. And once people get that, I think they get it, but you're absolutely right that if they don't get it, it seems like a real slap and a real like judgment. I mean, that's where I, I dropped the ball for a long time. I've heard some fantastic stories come from you, you know, at the various events that we've been at and listeners, you may have picked up that, uh, Mr. Twing here was one of the victims of the technical issues where we lost his first episode and he was kind enough to come back on and you told some fantastic stories then. I would love for you to tell us one now, your favorite story from your time in martial arts. Yeah, I told this last time. Um, this is my all time favorite of all things. I was in fifth grade. Uh, funny to remember things and you know that long ago but i remember it was fifth grade went to a tournament i was not a martial artist at the time um, i started in seventh grade uh, my my dad my, my father was stationed in osan in korea um, got a black belt in taekwondo at the time taste ago taekwondo and then and also a black belt in judo um, i joke around i'm 6'2 weigh 225 and my leg to torso ratio was perfect for judo so i look back with a little uh little sadness that my father could have chosen taekwondo or judo and he chose the one that physiologically i'm least uh likely to be successful in um, but my father came back and was always a, a martial arts instructor um, so i grew up in it i didn't you know the fish isn't aware of the water i didn't i wasn't aware Sort of that's that's what I was growing up in. I was just around it all the time. And we went, I, I accompanied him to a, a tournament. And the person who was the tournament director had recently been promoted to master rank. So, you know, it's very common. We've all experienced this, that you've called somebody Mr. or Miss or Mrs. for, for years, you know, often 10, 12 years. And then one day their, their rank changes, they're a master. And 
it's not disrespectful. It's just habit that we will occasionally re- refer to them as Mr. or Miss or Mrs. Often we correct ourselves immediately, uh, but it's, it's not disrespectful. It's just habit. So this particular tournament director uh, was, I remember there was a, a large crowd around him and people were engaging with him and asking him questions. And it was clear he was getting very angry. And finally he just stepped up, like stepped on a chair and then stepped on a table and it's such a weird thing to remember is it, it just this person towering over the crowd, wagging his finger at the audience saying, you know, my name is master so-and-so and I will not be referred to as Mr. And if, you know, basically if you do that, um, you're not welcome here. And I mean, really was mad. And I kind of looked over, you know, at my father, because my father at the you know, time was, was Mr. I'd never heard him. I, I don't even know that I was aware of the term master. It's other than like Hollywood at the time. Uh, my father looked over at me, you know, sort of the thing died down. And as we walked away, he looked over at me. He said, well, that's an important lesson. He said, you're going to meet two people, two types of people in your life. Uh, you're going to meet people like that who demand your respect. And then you're going to meet people who command your respect. And those people you want to be around. And you want to be somebody like that. Don't demand people's respect. You just, you do what you need to do. Um, and if you're earning their respect, it'll show up, you know, and that was it. That was it. And I don't know that we ever talked about that again. I don't have any memory of, of referring to that conversation again, but here I am 30 ish. I don't know how many years later, um, that I remember that conversation like it was yesterday. And I think about that conversation almost every single day of my life. I think about that. Am I, am I putting myself in a position where I am demanding somebody's respect? You know, Hey, look at me. Hey, don't you know how talented I am? Hey, don't you know how smart I am? Um, or am I just showing up and doing what needs to be done, whatever the situation is. And if I've, if I've earned that respect or not, that, that that's, that's what happens. That's what I get. Um, so if I want to show up and be an idiot, then, you know, I, I, I can't show up and be an idiot and then have like, why is everyone treating me like an idiot? Well, I showed up like an idiot. So that kind of makes sense. It was funny. I had this past weekend, I was at this, um, at this seminar where there was no, there were no uniforms and lots of different styles and probably 60 or so participants there. If you lined up all 60 after, like if we had, 20 minutes to just kind of hang out and engage and then 10 seconds of conversation. If I could walk down the line and have 10 seconds of conversation with each person who was there, I would be willing to bet that I would have an 80 or 90% hit rate to tell you who the, the people there who were uh, master rank or referred to themselves as masters or in some sort of tradition that had that with a significant level of accuracy. You know, you can recognize it instantly and you can recognize the people who maybe they have the title, but they, or they don't have the title or they wish they had the title, but it was, it was so incredibly evident by each person's presence. If they were commanding of one's respect or if they were demanding or just not looking for it at all. It's very interesting experience. How did that manifest for, for someone that maybe is newer to martial arts or just otherwise isn't quite sure they get what you're saying? What was the difference in those folks who conducted themselves as, we'll say, a master equivalent or not? I think it's humility. You know, it comes down, there's a courtesy element of it too. Um, but I, I, I think the signal is humility. I see that more often. And yeah, there's a saying, game recognizes game, you know, mastery recognizes mastery. I mean, if you're good at something and you see somebody else who's really good at something, it could be something totally different. You recognize that somebody's good at what they're doing. And I think there was a certain element of, uh, you could see those people there who, who had humility, who had, who carried themselves in a way where it was, they were there for the for the experience of training with this person, they were there to learn. They 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 brought an empty cup. Um, they they weren't trying to say, you know, okay, I'm I'm hearing what you're saying. I've paid to learn something from you, but now I'm going to tell you why I think I'm right. You could just sort of see that there was a question, or there was a drill, or there was something happening, um, and they were, you know, it was beginner's mind. Or if you were doing a partner drill, um, you could tell that they were not. They weren't trying to show you that they were great. They were just trying to be there and present and learn and and really that humility. 
it, but what became very interesting is by the end of the, you know, you're, you're pairing up with a lot of people over the course of many drills. And by the end, there were probably, I would guess, six or eight pairs of people working together. And of those six or eight pairs, there was some cross pollination where there were sort of people mixing within that group. But my guess is that group was all fairly sophisticated martial artists. Uh, at the end of the day, I think I think everybody self-selected with a lot of the criteria being no ego, total humility, but recognition that, OK, this person, this person knows what's up. And we weren't doing drills that would have shown a martial arts technical skill, really. I mean, you'd sort of how you carry yourself kind of shows that a little bit, but that's not what the indicator was. So I think it's just, you know, I think there is a humility to someone who is it's, it's like, you know, I was a. I was worked security in a bar for a couple of years in college. The person running their mouth wanting to fight is not scary. The person who stares at you in the eyes, knowing there's violence all around and looks really calm, that person's scary. That's the person you take very seriously. Um, and that is, it's a humility. It's a calmness. It's, uh, yeah, there's a certain, there's a certain, I had that experience years later, you know, being in just happening to be with a friend in a bar where sort of a classic right out of the movies bar fight happened. Um, and it was my friend's group of friends and this other group of people had nothing to do with me and I wanted nothing to do with it. And across the way, I noticed somebody watching it and it was, just, it was so interesting to watch him. I was like, that is the one person in this whole situation that I would not want to tangle with because he looks very calm and sort of passively watching and and after like the mayhem stopped and the police came and the mayhem was ended I went and talked to him um, and he was a PDR spear instructor and not a huge guy or anything else but he was perfectly okay in that environment we, we had a great conversation and it was kind of funny because we were both sort of watching each other and like why does that guy look totally calm in this situation when there's violence all around. I just found that fascinating. That's the same thing we picked up on at the seminar and other things. You can look around and know uh, who you know who needs to be in your face to assert that they're great and who needs to just stand back and um, let that reveal itself or not and not care. Mm. We started off the conversation talking a lot about ego and it seems like that dovetails in. You know, it's it's the the need to get in your face and remind people that you're great or you deserve a title or, or something. Whereas the other folks who have, we'll say, accomplished things, who have earned respect, who know that they've earned the respect of those around them, they don't need to ask. They don't need to talk about it. It just, it is. Yeah, and I think there's also an element of recognizing the more, the more that you learn, you re, the more you realize you, you, you don't know anything. Like that was my experience this weekend. I've, I've been involved in a martial art for 34 years. Um, you know, I, I'm a fourth degree black belt, so I, I have some, some competence in the martial art. I and mean, I couldn't fake it this far. Um, I, I feel like there's, you know, I kind of, I kind of get some things, but, at, you know, but when I, you know, I was talking to my, my best friend after, the events, you know, what did you think? And I said, I think it's going to take me the next 10 years to unpack 5% of what I learned. And, and I wasn't saying that I wasn't being facetious. It was kind of like that recognition. Like, yeah, I mean, I, I certainly have a, a level of expertise in this area, but that's one path up the mountain and we're all climbing the same mountain. There are lots of other paths. So I could go laterally and go explore a different path. So I know that that there's a lot that I I don't know. By the fact that I'm on a path, I'm not on a hundred others. So there's that. And then to be around someone and train with someone who is truly a master, I mean, in the purest sense of the word, who brings content and a, a way of seeing things that is just so profoundly interesting and to realize, okay, just for me to understand what he explained at the most basic level that he understands it. I, I probably need a decade to really, to really get there. Even with that, you know, him and it's with his expertise showing where all the kicks quicksand is and what to avoid. I still need a solid 10 years to, 
to internalize 5% of that. Like, I think that's a big part of it. Um, it's the, you know, the, the instructors who don't, or not just instructors, but any practitioner of any art, not just the martial arts who are like, okay, I, you know, I've, I've got the rank or I've hit the level. And, and, and that's, that's either I'm stopping or I'm, I'm going to focus on some other thing. And maybe the other thing that you focus on, there's an opportunity for tremendous amounts of growth. Like maybe you're a competitor. Now you're an instructor. Um, and you focus on your growth as an instructor, which changes. It's, it's less about bringing the best out in yourself and how do you bring the best out in others? Well, that's an art too. Like there's, and there are certain people who will do that and they will pull it apart and reconstruct it and realize that they really don't know anything at all compared to what there is to know. And, and that to me is, that's such a sign. It's such a beautiful thing to see where to be around somebody who is so profoundly masterful at something and to have them have total humility and, and no ego because they know so much that they know they really don't know anything. You know, they've seen the void. And when you see the void, you realize, okay, right. So, um, you know, I use the example of a round kick all the time. You know, there's, I, I've been working on my round kick for a long time. I don't expect to have my round kick perfect ever. And there's always more work to be done. Um, and at the same time, I'm not going to quit working on it. I love working on it. But I have I have no expectation ever that I'm like you know what this this is it my round kick it's, I'm done I've got it figured out I can you know on demand it'll be perfect no it's just forever it's always something to learn I spent a half an hour this morning like with some epiphany about pelvis position with a round kick I'm like where did they have 34 years how did I not notice this <laughs> right like what what just happened here how, you know how did I not miss this obvious thing and I never would have seen it had three things, three disparate things not come together within five days of each other that, I mean, totally random things that came together. And I realized, wow, I've, I've been, I've been approaching something that I do as a fundamental movement in my practice, um, incompletely for the last 30, 40 years. Now I have to reset and think about it. That's just, that to me is what's so beautiful about this. It's fascinating stuff. And it's amazing how those epiphanies, those moments of clarity can come from the strangest sort of non-martial arts scenarios, you know, to, to watch someone moving around. One of the things you and I have in common that the listeners don't know is fitness that, you know, we, we both have some rather passionate views on exercise and fitness and strength. And I'm going to guess for you, because I know it's the case for me that my time spent in gymnastics and in parkour and in CrossFit have led to epiphanies in martial arts. Yeah, absolutely. It's funny. That it's such an interesting, I love serendipity. It's such an interesting that, that you said that because um, this weekend at this seminar there, one of the realizations that I had was exactly that. Like I didn't have a metaphor for what I was learning. I didn't have some scaffolding I could hang it on. Um, and the person who was my partner at one point, um, for some reason, we just got talking about previous training. We, he mentioned that he had trained in kettlebells for years, which I did as well. And we both simultaneously realized, like it immediately realized that the drill that we were doing was 100% analogous to the kettlebell snatch. So when you learn the snatch, for anyone who's not familiar with the snatch, it's a ballistic movement where you take a kettlebell from uh, a hips loaded position, hips back, uh, body upright, um, kettlebell between the legs and then propel it up with your hips up overhead and insert your hand in the handle. And because it's a ballistic move, you can't, you can't half do a snatch. Um, so the, the way you train the snatch is you train a one handed swing progressively higher and you tra train a one handed clean where you're bringing up the kettlebell at, at chest height to get your hand in the handle. And then at some point, someone just says snatch <laughs> the instructor or whatever it is. And you put those two things together and there's no, there's no room for like, oh, I didn't quite do it. The, the kettlebell goes up, your hand has to, you know, 53 pounds or whatever it is, 70 pounds. You, the kettlebell goes up, the hand has to go in the handle up over your head in one moment. That what was three things or two things or many things becomes one thing. And as we were talking about that, the, the, the movement that we were doing, the practice that we were learning, I was like, this, this is the kettlebell snatch because we're doing we're learning something, you know, we're learning the one-handed swing, right? 
we're learning this thing. And then we've also learned this other thing and this other thing. And my guess is tomorrow, these things that feel like three things are going to become one thing and that our mind will see what was three things it will now see as one thing. And when, when the mind sees it as one thing, that's where you get the efficiency, that's where you get the myelinization of the circuits in the brain and your physiology that fires it faster. You know, that's where that expression comes from, that you know, an amateur practices something until he gets it right, and a professional practices something until she can't get it wrong. You know, when, you've, when you have wrapped a circuit with so much myelin in your brain that it fires so fast that you can't do it wrong, uh, like yeah, I've mentioned my best friend several times, Master Gordon White. We've been friends for 32-ish years. Um, I don't know if he can do a round kick wrong. Uh, it would be interesting. I think he would have a really difficult time doing a poor round kick because he has a circuit that – and he has lots of different variations, but he has a circuit in his physiology that is labeled round kick. And when he fires that circuit, a thing happens so efficiently – and so effectively that he, I don't know that he could do it incorrectly. And that's really, to me, is such a fascinating thing where we can take something that we already know how to do and use that as a scaffolding to build something else onto it, recognizing like, okay, this is the same thing. Like this drill, which was a, a power generation drill to show how we pull power out of the ground and express it in our extremity, that knowing that that's a kettlebell snatch in my mind, now I know the progression from here to there. I know how long it took me to learn how to do a snatch effectively. I know what it feels like now. And now I know what the next couple of years look like for me in this other practice. I think that's so neat. Uh, there's something about that that's so powerful. This has been awesome. This has been a lot of fun. And, you know, a, a bit of a different conversation than we had last time, but I think better. I th- nice. I th- huh? Yeah, it's great. I, it's, yeah. it's funny because I, I don't, I never know what I'm going to say until I hear myself say it. So I kind of remember the last conversation, but then there's so much of it I don't really remember. Um, and I think things happen for reasons, right? They do. I mean, we covered some ground last time, and I think exactly um, it wasn't for whatever reason the universe steps in and says, "Yeah, that was a great conversation for the two of you to have," but the, the world didn't need to hear it, <laughs> <Right. laughs> or, or our small world didn't need yeah. to hear it, um, which is funny you know, to think about. Right. Right now, I. You know, I'm going to see you in a week, which is awesome. I'm excited for that. But for those folks not fortunate enough as I am that we'll get to get some time with you soon. If people want to reach out to you, if they want to get a hold of you, you know, how would they do that? Yeah, the best thing to do is send me an email. Um, it's stwing, S-T-W-I-N-G at gmail.com. That's the easiest way uh, to reach me. Um, I am not a professional martial artist. I'm a hobbyist. I run my own business uh, by day. I train, um, you know, I train during the day and I train at night as well, but I don't, um, I, I don't have a, a, a gym to promote or a course to promote or anything like that. I'm a, you know, I'm a, I'm beginner's mind. I'm right out there learning, learning, learning with everybody else. Uh, one thing I do want to mention, though, which I think is really interesting, uh, this is that gets back to that weird universe thing. So at our on our last conversation, one of the questions you asked me was, if I could train with any martial artist um, in the world, who would I train with? You know, my first answer was my father, because I lost my father when uh, I was 29 uh, to cancer. And But my second answer was this gentleman, DKU, who was a Korean um, just the, he's been called a reincarnation of Bruce Lee, and he's just he's tapped into something. I've been following him for years on YouTube and trying to find anything I could find about him. So after the, so in the problem, the challenge with DKU is that um, he offers courses in, in one-on-one training in Korea, um, and he's occasionally traveled to uh, to Europe. And we, you know, I haven't been back to Korea since I tested, but I've had in the back of my mind that if you know, our next Korea trip, if I go, that I would. It's sort of a bucket list thing. I would go train with DKU and try to make that happen. Uh, but a couple of friends of mine and I are going to Europe in the fall. So after, literally after our last call, I said, you know what? I need to, you know, maybe what's, maybe there's this crazy chance that DKU is going to be in Europe. And, you know, while we're there and I'll just, if he is, I'll just stay a little extra. I'll go to the thing. I mean, absolutely. I was totally psyched for it. And with, not joking, within an hour of our last call, uh, I went to 
I'm sorry, it was a day after our last call. I went to uh, his website, and there it was, February 24th, 25th, New York City, first time, DKU in the United States. And I was like, how weird is that? Like, how crazy is that? And that's the seminar I went to last weekend. And I, and I don't think – I don't, I don't think I would have seen that. I mean, I, I might have stumbled on it. Who knows? But I would not have actively gone and looking, looked for that had we not had this conversation last time. And I would have missed a life-changing martial arts experience, training experience. That's so so cool. I owe you a huge thanks to you <laughs> and the universe for making that happen, which I think is incredible. Well, I, I think 101% of any debt you have is to the universe, not to me. We just talked about it. <laughs> And, and we wouldn't have talked about it had it not been for you. And this is a good time to mention, folks, of course, if you are new to the show, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. It's where we'll drop the show notes. Um, you know, we'll, we'll link to Master Gordon White, who we've talked about today, and, and DKU's website, and, and anything else that we've talked about that seems worth sharing with you all. I thank you for being here. It's been a lot of fun. As always, I, I love our conversations. And, you know, this one we just happened to record, but I know we'll have more in the future that listeners you won't get to hear because you know what? i can't record my whole life for you <laughs> <laughs> and i would just love for you to send us out with some some parting words some last bits of wisdom for everyone yeah, this this took me a long time to figure out and i hope to shortcut everybody else's uh learning experience you know we there is a science to practicing well a, a, a deeply studied science of how to practice well and how to practice practice effectively. Um, you know, it's a, a gentleman by the name of Kay Anders Erickson has really pioneered this research. He's the one who came up with it, um, the research that Malcolm Gladwell used in Outliers. Unfortunately, Malcolm Gladwell completely misinterpreted the data, uh, completely misinterpreted the research, uh, never talked to Anders Ericsson. So if you've read Outliers, you're like, oh yeah, I know it's 10,000 hours and that's how you become excellent at something. That's actually not true at all. Um, but Kay Anders Ericsson has written a book. It's called Peak. Um, and it's about purposeful practice and the different types of practice. Um, deliberate practice probably isn't accessible to most of us because that requires a coach and sort of full time and other things, but purposeful practice is. And what, how we've been taught to practice isn't entirely effective. Going out and doing things that you're doing that you know how to do and repeating them over and over and over again, whether it's a form or a technique or whatever it is, the, the research is pretty clear. Actually, the research is exceptionally clear. You're, you're not getting any better. You're doing, doing the same things over and over again is not the path to getting better. Um, but there is a very clear evidence-based path to getting pet better if you can get it for like 14 bucks on amazon on a kindle in the kindle format it'll take you two hours to read it and it will transform uh, your practice martial arts practice or any other one so if there's any wisdom i can offer it's that it's not my wisdom <laughs> it's the wisdom of others uh, and that book is absolutely essential to any martial artist practice what a great episode thank you mr twink for sharing your ideas as well as your values I admire your passion, your humility, and the openness with which you spoke. Thank you for your time and your friendship. If you want to check out the show notes with everything we've talked about today, you can find those at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Sign up for the newsletter and maybe share this episode or another one of your favorites with somebody who hasn't found the show yet. The numbers keep going up. We keep finding new listeners, and that means the world to me. As I've said before, without listeners, I'm just a crazy guy on a microphone talking to himself, or in this case, one other person. That's lonely. So knowing that you're out there listening, that's helpful, meaningful, and I appreciate it. Feel free to reach out. You can comment at the show notes. You can get to us via social media. We are at Whistlekick. Or if you'd like to email me directly, jeremy at whistlekick.com. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. <laughs>